All right, so we're doing a video of brain and brain parts and how they all kind of fit together. Uh, I'll try to do a nice, quick summary of it all. Spinal cord, okay. medulla oblongata, pons, mesencephalon, diencephalon. All right, within the diencephalon, you have the thalamus with the little interthalamic adhesion. You have the hypothalamus, which is connected to the pituitary gland. All right, we have the corpus callosum that connects the right and left cerebral hemispheres. This is known as the choroid plexus. Choroid plexus that manufactures the cerebral spinal fluid that's going to fill the ventricles. Cerebrum, and you can see the gyri, the elevations, and the sulci, the depressions. Cerebellum, and you can see the white matter, shaped like a tree, arbor vitae, surrounded by the tan, that's the gray matter. Right. Those are basic components, some other things that we know. All right, here's our cervical vertebrae, Here's our intervertebral discs. Here's our sphenoid sinus. Here's our frontal sinus. Here's our nasal concha. Some other basic things that we've looked at. All right, let's pop this guy on top. Nothing really different here, right? Same things. Maybe the arborvitae is a little bit more defined but all basically same parts. There's your thalamus with your interthalamic adhesion, maybe a little bit clearer to see. And here's where the hypothalamus is. All right. On this part right here, you can see where they've cut open the two cerebral hemispheres. Your right cerebral hemisphere with the longitudinal fissure down the center, separating the two, and the left. But here you can see the white matter surrounded by the gray. So this is known as the cerebral cortex, the gray matter, and the white matter. These various models, okay, same kind of stuff. Again, medulla oblongata, pons. Pons connects with the cerebellum. Okay, so information from the cerebellum through the pons to the cerebrum, cerebrum through the pons to the cerebellum, mesencephalon, diencephalon, with there's the oval shaped thalamus, interthalamic adhesion, hypothalamus. Here's your corpus callosum, there's the choroid plexus producing cerebral spinal fluid. Okay. I just flip this over, you can now see all the gyri and sulci, right? Elevations gyri in between the depressions of the sulci. All right. Same thing going on here. Okay, same stuff. All right, now, we got the colored version, okay, and the plain version. All right, so let's move that. And then I took some of it apart. All right, what they've done here is they've painted some of the gyri because each gyri represents some sort of functional information. Before we go to that, let's talk about lobes. So lobes and gyri are two different things. The lobes are very simple. The lobes are named based on the bone that covers it. So here and here, frontal bone, frontal lobe. It contains several gyri. Parietal bone, parietal lobe. Frontal, parietal. Occipital bone, occipital lobe. Occipital lobe. Temporal bone, temporal lobe. All right, so you see one frontal, two parietal, three occipital, four temporal, all right, so this is what we have there. Okay, this is what we have. 
And now I'm gonna take it apart. I'm taking the temporal lobe off. And look what's underneath. A little surprise for everyone. Surprise! Okay. Another, quote, lobe. Now you see the gyri and sulci? That's called the insula. So it's right underneath the temporal lobe. There's the insula and it has more gyri and sulci on it. And you see the little painting there. All right, showing you an individual gyrus. And we'll talk about their functions now. All right. Uh, here's a separated one half of the cerebellum, okay, one of the lobes. You see it has little folds on it, known as folia. There are two halves, there's a right and left hemisphere, and they're connected in the center right here, this little bit that connects them, that's known as the vermis. Not sure where the other half has gone. So let's look at these colors. All right. So we've painted some of the gyri. We've painted some of the gyri in the occipital lobe, dark green, light green. We painted some of the gyri in the temporal lobe, dark orange, light orange. That's what I'm calling it. Here in the frontal and parietal, we painted red and light red, pink, dark blue, and it would have been wonderful if this would have been painted light blue. Everything would have been jolly, right? Just a little holiday joke in there, right? Okay. So these represent specific functions. For example, the dark green is known as the visual cortex. It's where all sensory information from your eyes is deposited. So if your eyeball is here and the light is passing through and images are entering and hitting the retina, traveling via the optic nerve, this is where that data goes. Notice that there's a pattern here, dark light, dark light, dark light. For our purposes, the lighter colors represent what's called an association area. Sometimes I say primary, secondary, meaning that they work together hand in hand. One supports the other. The primary receives the data. The secondary processes the data. The names, the true names, visual cortex, visual association area. What do these things mean? The association areas are where information that you have already been exposed to is stored. Can we call it memory? It could be called memory. So that when you view something, so let's say I'm viewing this. I'm looking at that with my eye. That information is being received here. Do I know what that is? Have I ever seen that before? Has this image been, quote, stored here in the association area? Well, because I've done the class multiple times, it has. So when I see this, it's received, and then the primary area works along with the secondary area, or the visual cortex works along with the visual association area to say, do you have this image there? Yes, I do. Oh, what is it? Well, this will then go on to work with other areas of the brain to say that is one half of the cerebellum. All right, because I've seen it before. If I've never seen this before, like for example, this thing. I've never seen this before. There it goes, it gets there. This is gonna say, have you ever seen this before? Nope. What do you mean, no? Well, I've seen something shaped like that, long and skinny. I've seen that color before, but I have never been told that this is the stick we use in lab on the model instead of a pen, right? <laughs> never been told that. So, the association areas assist the primary areas 
in interpreting and understanding what's being received. So here's for vision. This is for hearing. Now, this is opposite of what's in the book. Don't freak out. I'm using dark light. Dark light, dark light, right? The darker area, this is gonna be the auditory cortex. And this is going to be the auditory association area. So the same story applies for things that I hear. This is the somatic sensory cortex where all somatic sensory data goes, meaning someone's poking me with a stick, pinching me, hot, cold, all somatic sensory input goes here and then you have a large somatic asso sensory association area next to it. Sensory association, secondary area, primary area, primary somatic sensory cortex. So these are all sensory. Remember our little insula? All right. This gyrus is for taste. So you've got a primary for taste, meaning the gustatory cortex with an association area. This is for smell. You've got an olfactory cortex with an association area. All sensory. This one, as we referred to earlier today, is for motor. So this is your primary somatic motor cortex. This is where each muscle has its own little home. And if I want to contract my biceps brachii, I'm going to send a signal from this area of what's known as the homunculus down to the biceps brachii and contract it. This is the association area, all right? The somatic motor association area. This is where motor patterns are stored. Meaning, if I want to contract my biceps brachii, one single muscle, simple movement, no big deal. If I want to write my name, right? When I was born, I didn't know how to write my name. It's unfortunate. But I learned over time how to make an S, an A, an L. But that's a complex pattern. I gotta move my arm and multiple muscles of my arm in multiple ways. Once I learn how to write my name, the pattern, the sequence of events is stored and I can pull it out as needed. I don't have to relearn. Oh, an S, uh, go up, go back, go down, oh, whoop, go front. I store the sequence of events in the association area. I pull it out and then send down the proper sequence to write my name, to hit a ball, to throw a bowling ball, right? to play badminton, all the things that you love to do. Bowling, badminton, sewing, right? Your favorite pastimes. So all of that is stored here in the association area and it's pulled out as needed. So you have primary areas and secondary areas.